for my vacation for my honeymoon we went to oregon mm -hmm. and that was the first time i'd seen the pacific ocean like oh, up really? close okay yeah and so like my wife was too cool for school and she just kind of hung back but i was like out there running around rolling around and it being Got like it. this is amazing you know i don't care about like the local like people drinking craft beer on the like beach You're like oh what a tourist <laughs> Welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and tonight I'm going to ask Father and Cyprian, what was your least favorite topic or uh, what was your least favorite uh, class in school, like subject? Oh, no, sorry. Well, I screwed that up. Not your least favorite. I think we all know Father and I's least favorite is probably math. What was your Mine favorite? Too. Okay, so Cyprian too. What was your favorite subject in school? History. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I'm I'm going to say biology. Ooh. I really I had like, a great biology teacher. I think that's only really like school biology teacher was incredible. Huh? Yep, we did a lot of dissections in his class. I took his biology class, his AP biology class, and then also his AP psychology class and ace my AP exams. This Cor Clifford Corigliano, shout out to him if he's still alive. Incredible teacher. Best teacher I ever had and any level all the way even up to university incredible incredible teacher and i still remember so much biology i still remember almost everything that i learned back in high school it's incredible yeah um when i first got back into college and i was all zoomed up on adderall and mind you at this time but i had just had my first uh psychedelic experience i was working out a ton and i was just started taking a lot of adderall I had this biology class and for the first time ever in school, I was doing well. And I remember that biology class, like that, like um, the only thing I really remember from it is uh, nodes of Ranvier. Do you like, it's like mm -hmm. the, it's like how it, um, electrical current goes up and down. Like, um, Oh yeah. It like gets propelled and someone's going to correct me on this. I don't care. Th that's not the point, but like, it's like somehow like it as it becomes positively charged, like the synaptic the synaptic nerve um like flips over and like the electricity goes along the current and then it like flips back over. Is this in the like brain? That. Is this in the brain? Is this a it's brain like thing leading or a nervous nervous brain. system thing? So I think it's your central nervous system leading up okay. into your brain. It, it I, I can't remember exactly what the nature of it was, but I was just became a catechumen as well. So a lot going on in my life at that time. I remember studying this part of that and I had an icon of Christ of his resurrection, like mm -hmm. sitting in front of me. Um, and I remember just like looking up and be like, what did you do? Like, this is incredible. <laughs> like, wow, this is awesome. And it was like, maybe it was the Adderall, maybe it was the psychedelics. I have no idea. But like, that was a really powerful experience because I had just like, and my teacher was Catholic. He was not the most mm -hmm. amazing teacher I've ever had, but he's Catholic. And he's really good at like trying to be like, okay, you know, this is this is an argument for life is mm. just a little bit too complex to have just happened accidentally type of thing. So mm. um, I I would be tempted to say history is my favorite. I really love history. I still love history. I didn't like learning about it in school because it was very dry. Right. It was very dry for me. There's a lot of dates, a lot of names I didn't really understand. Um, I think English and writing and literature were always going to be my favorite because it's just, that was kind of my, kind of my bag. Did, so. did you have, did you have good history teachers, father no. in school? Um, I had one really great history teacher, Dr. Lang. Mm. And um, Dr. Lang was great because he, he was a substitute teacher. He, the big thing for me was he recognized within me I was in I was in this 
really kind of like um, difficult, almost treacherous, treacherous space where mm. I was, I hate to say this, but, you know, I was like intelligent, but didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be a nerd anymore because I'd been a nerd my whole life, whatever. And I was really starting to gravi gravitate towards more of the barbaric aspects of cult, you know, subculture and things like that, you know. And um, how old were you at this time, Father? Thirteen. Okay. Thirteen. So violence and things like that were just kind of starting to take more precedent for me. And um, he he had this book. He had been had traveled everywhere. He had gone to Egypt and kind of like mapped the energy point lines. He's a new ager guy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I can't remember what we were talking about. Um, I think we might have been talking about Stonehenge or something at that point. And I, I was talking about Druidism, whatever. And that kind of like opened up afterwards a conversation and he kind of showed me his like notebook and stuff like that. And he just, he in a, he in a long story short, in a nutshell, he, he made me feel like it was okay to mm. be a nerd kind of. And um, he affirmed that. You were a nerd in the eighties. That must've been rough. Yeah. I mean, he, he affirmed, he, he affirmed in me and it helped me on a little bit longer to, to not kind of leave off that, that part of me. Mm. Um, and so even like it, it kind of helped me to really um, move forward, even as I started getting into like working class culture and like starting like that's when I started studying like socialism and like movements like that. Um, it just gave me kind of like a green light to to not be embarrassed about that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and he was he was just I don't know, he just he was really cool. He 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 touched me in a way like, oh, he, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I hated him. I used, to, I used to throw spitballs at him and, you know, whatever. Whatever. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, listen, when you're, when you're a young man and, you know, having all the right answers and all that stuff, I mean, look, you know, that's like eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And, like, if you're not like um, I want to be, super... <laughs> if you're not in certain ethnic groups at this point in time or in certain social circles at this time, mm -hmm. and having all the answers during history class and stuff, it wasn't cool, man. You right. know what I mean? Like it's right. it doesn't seem like it seems like whatever now because now we're living in the age of the nerd and nerd is cool nerd. and that stuff. Mm -hmm. But like at that time, it was it was it was not cool for the first time popular quote-unquote popular cool kids are asking me what's going to happen in the infinity saga because i've read the comics like well what's going to happen next i'm like well i'm just kidding nobody's asking me that but <laughs> yeah. I mean, in my mind people are but nobody's asking me that stuff yeah. um you know it's interesting father i would say now like i obviously i love history and like but it's I, and I can retain so much of it because I think all through school, it never was really any kind of a story for me. Like there was like I needed in the narr I needed in the story. I needed in the why. Like Andrew says, like, you can't just give me dates and say this happened, this happened. Like, you got to explain to me, like, what's the story? What's what's the story that's taking place? I didn't get that in all of school until classics in university which i had to take as uh requirements for my for philosophy for a philosophy mm -hmm. major taking classics then right so it's like the art the architecture the philosophy taking it through the whole time and then it's like oh like the ancient world being like oh here's the story that's going through the ancient world and then similar to you father it was uh getting like zechariah sitchin's books mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. like seeing the way that that ancient, yeah. whether it's right or wrong, but the, the fact that somebody had for the first time in my life put a story, yeah, an interesting story about like, well, here's this lineage of things that people are, and it's just like, that's and, it. Then it was like, okay, now it's yeah. Over. Yeah. I mean, honestly, 
because here's the other thing too is like isn't it the same reason why i mean for me it was why dungeons and dragons was so awesome yeah you know I, mean? I mean it's it's a thing you know narrative narrative the, na- the narrative which is, is very, which very is important. this is a whole funny thing because this is you know the the little lecture i just gave just a couple minutes ago we started talking about that was like narrative and it's funny because at the doxicon conference which was great shout out to richard and to uh, father david like we were talking about and this is just my opinion it, it might be somewhere deep in, in, in the fathers, whatever. And the fathers might say I'm wrong and I'll, I'll gladly recant it. But I, I, I'm, I'm at a place right now where I don't see narrative as a construct of man. Mm-hmm. I see narrative um, as something that originates from the mind of God, you know? Mm-hmm. And because we bear his image, it, it's, it's something that we, we have to kind of engage. In, and that's how we see reality as narrative because I mean, yeah, it's like the through line. It's like, it's the thing that like, I, yeah, I don't think it's a man-made construct. I, yeah, I just don't think it is. And I think that like, like most things it's been repurposed and like changed into something that I don't know. It's because there is a narrative. There's always a narrative. And like, then Mm. like people are able to like, um, or powers, principalities and people are able to grab that and change that narrative because like and i don't want to get into it but have you guys like have been noticing how they're treating the flu this year like covid yeah like it's like cases are surging and like they're saying cases are surging oh Um, they've got an mrna because they've got an mrna flu jab now that's a combined oh i didn't know covid flu woke poke mrna that's a combination not surprising, but still crazy. And there was one article. It was like, um, <clears throat> um, children having to wait in waiting room to get hospital bed from flu. I'm like, okay, when are they not? I don't think I've ever gotten straight into a room ever. Like whenever I've gone yeah. into a hospital, and I live in a not a metropolitan a metropolitan area at all. Like it's yeah. it's not even like I'm talking millions of people here. We're talking like a like some hundred thousands of people and i've i've never really gotten straight into a hotel and, and like, i'm assuming that they're in a that this is in an emergency room waiting room right so it's like well yeah there's such a thing as triage and like if the child is there and the child's got a flu you know what i mean it's like sure. guess where you are are you there with mom and dad have, have you been given some ibuprofen guess where you are on the list <laughs> way down at the bottom right. of course you're waiting the gunshot victim the heart attack the car crash right. that like they're gonna get priority over you it's called triage <laughs> yeah. my child's gotta wait it's like there's somebody having a heart attack but what, that, do, you, what do you want <laughs> that's that, i think that i think that's what i was trying to say with the narrative thing is, is yeah. like um and then Zelensky just is going on some ground that was already um that was supposedly retook from russia and is like discovering war crimes, landmines, litter everywhere, make it difficult. And I'm like, I mean, first off, I'll gladly be wrong about this. I'm still saying, prove to me that Zelensky is real. Like, I mean, not like an AI, like powered, like hologram or something. You can't make this guy up. But, uh, and uh, then, like, not only that, but it's just like, it's so obvious that when you're able to see narrative is what it's supposed to be, what it's being used for now. And it's like, okay, well, because someone said this to me a couple of years ago and um, I won't, we won't belabor the point after this, we can move on. But in every dystopian novel, there's a brother from the church, but every dystopian novel, there's a point where the character is like, do I believe any of this is real? Because yeah, I was yeah. just reading some story the other day. It was some some historical story. I was talking about the benefits of something, and I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. But the 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 particular writer is constructing it as a very positive, good thing that this thing happened. Um, and I got to the point where I was like, "Do I believe that? Do I believe that that was a good thing? Do I believe that like?" Um, ah. So okay, for example, suffrage 
the suffrage movement. And they're talking about like the incredible, like pioneering, courageous women that that fought for, you know, the suffrage movement. I'm like, but do I believe that that was a good thing? I mean, like, of course, like, I mean, I think women should have the vote, of course, but like, did the suffragists handle it correctly? I mean, were they doing, were they, would I be able have to- Have you ever investigated the occult roots of that? No. Yeah, yeah, so, there's and always that's, that. Ooh. That's where it all starts to break apart is a sister from the church is kind of breaking this down for me a couple of weeks ago. And I was just like, oh, snap. Like, it makes sense, too, when you start looking back into it. And then what's her name? I can never remember her name. The super racist lady that everything. Sanger? What's that? Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger. Yeah. She's a big time occultist, you know? Yeah. Well, this, <laughs> this brings up this brings up an interesting. It goes straight to the narrative thing. And I think, Father, I'd like to get your your thoughts on this, because it was something just a couple of days ago, just over the weekend hanging out. We have a family friend who's here who lives on the island. Uh, she's European, right? Uh, she's French. And so, you know, raised within the Catholic milieu, but doesn't practice, right? She's very kind of cosmopolitan, metropolitan, whatever. And I don't know how it came up, but there was a, we started talking about marriage. And I think because that we were talking about some other friends of ours on the island and are they divorced or not? Oh, but she had a, she's, had a baby with another man and oh this is you know we're just kind of talking about this and she just said she said something about marriage like yes of course you know i was raised catholic and like the thing you know with catholics and marriage and can't get divorced and all of that and i was like well we're orthodox so there's kind of you know there's a there's a through line there about like you know it's it, if you're married like that's what it's going to be and she's like you know to me this this makes no sense and i think that this gets to the narrative part right she's like if you don't love the person you just don't love the person and like I don't understand what what makes marriage something special at all. Like what what makes it anything special? And it was very interesting to me because it was right at that moment where I was like, oh, I actually like my being, my understanding of the world has actually altered since I've converted. Because immediately when she said that, I was like, oh, no, no. But it's and what was going through my mind is like, Oh, no, no, but it's an icon mm -hmm. like yeah. your marriage. <laughs> like, no, no, no. It's a and and I think that this idea of because I know we have a topic and I think that this might be a way of getting into it. Sure. This idea of. Living your life through the sacraments, through a life in the church, through a life in prayer in a way that is in order. Right. So that it's like marriage is sort of like a resonance. This is how it was popping off in my mind. And I, I couldn't explain it to her just right, but I was trying to give her my feeling for it, that it's something like there's an order to the world and that if you will, that that is from God, and that if you will work inside this order, if you will live inside this order in something like marriage, then you are moving sort of in the resonance or the vibration or the order of the world that's around and things will fall into place if you are willing to work with there's it. A, there's a harmony there. There's a harmony. That's exactly the word, the, the thing that I'm trying to, that, that you're in harmony. But then if you decide that you're not going to do that, like she was saying, she was like, well, if you don't love the person, then you don't love them. And I was like, well, but what are we mean by love? For real. Right? Like, do, do I, I was like, well, if I'm feeling like I need to leave, maybe that's an evidence of a sickness in me, right? Like maybe I have a sickness that I, and she was, she just couldn't, she was like, no, I don't. Now, by the end of this conversation, she was kind of like, hmm, you know, because we started talking about sacrifice and some things and she was like, huh, I kind of get it. But I was, it, it had kicked off to me. And I think, because we, we, we had a topic about addiction and I think that this goes into it, drugs becoming legal, this sort of situation, like, this fa father, could you just talk a little bit so that I could have a better and maybe then we can we can jump in and maybe this will be a, a good basis. But like, can we just flesh out the idea of and maybe that marriage is a good place to, to start, but like fleshing out the idea of marriage as an icon and what it means to be moving in order in that way. Is that does it make sense what I'm asking or what I want to flesh I think out? So. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I understand it on its on its, on the face of it. Um but I think in order to understand, I don't, this may not make sense, but I think, I 
think we need to I, I want to highlight a problem first and then kind of get into that um people can get caught up in some of the kind of incidentals of it the wood and the paint of the icon and even like the style of the icon if that makes sense you know and so it's like these right what we always talk about the dichotomies right the insertion of the dichotomies and wanting to kind of like separate and um dissect everything is what keeps us from seeing the icon in the whole so the icon in its totality not just what the icon's made of how it's made but also you know how you experience the icon all those things have to kind of be seamlessly experienced authentically simultaneously in order to really get it when we begin to chop it up um we're not actually experiencing the icon it's becoming something else is that making sense at all what i'm saying right there yeah. Yes, so we're taking a holistic approach to it. Yeah, so this is important because, you know, one of the biggest problems with marriage is that it's it's not looked at holistically. And what I mean by that is people look at marriage as a so social construct, social contract. They're not, I don't, I'm to make a distinction there. Social construct, social contract. Um, marriage as a means to kind of personal fulfillment you know what I mean? Whether that's sexuality, whether it's financially, whether it's emotionally, um, you know, all of these things are these kind of facets, but not taking account the whole of what it is, which fundamentally is almost impossible for anyone in the modern day to do because no one sees marriage in the context of, of the divine, in the context of Christ and the church. So... Even Christians don't, you know, when I do marriage counseling or in, you know, enrichment as I like to call it, um, one of the first things I do is I have the the couples start, I give them a, an understanding of how they were taught to see marriage versus how the church would have you see marriage, which is essentially the orientation between the couple um, and like, many Orthodox have this orientation unfortunately of they learn they're looking at each other and that goes both ways they're looking at each other in the problem you're the problem no you're the problem or they're looking at each other for fulfillment right you're going to fulfill me you're the one who makes me happy i i need to i need whatever it's going to be you know um the woman looking at the man to validate her emotional insecurities or you know um whatever the situation, the man looking to her to satiate his, you know, his sexual impulses and desires. You know what I mean? Like, like those things looking at each other in such an exclusive, exclusive manner always leads to this kind of disappointment. And that disappointment begins to fulfill these kind of latent fears. And these latent fears begin to, you know, become something that erodes and eats at not just the marriage, but the person's sense of, reality in themselves and who god is right mm. so it's making sense right yeah so totally absolutely so like so all those things are the problem and it's gonna be really hard to talk about you know marriage as an icon in the way that like i feel we need to talk about it if i don't highlight those problems first right um so when you so what i so what you do what i try to do is to get people to understand their orientation needs to be looking at christ not each other so you know marriage is a you know what is man man is the totality of uh, you know the whole woman and man is what compromise is what is what comprises man mankind right adam is man and woman actually right um woman is made from the side of, of man right um not the foot not the head the side and um, we can get into the whole thing of like Greek mythology and all these different kinds of creatures, like we get into all that, but like there's truth to it, right? And so the thing is, is like that's that's what man, if you want to know what mankind is, you have to see both man and woman together, which is one of the reasons why homosexuality is such a problem. So anyways, um, which we can drill down on that maybe because it, it begins to, you know, we begin to really see why it's a problem, 
you know, and it, and it isn't the you factor of homosexual acts. The, the problem is homosexuality as an identity, which fundamentally, you know, kind of reinforces this um, inversion and idolatrous kind of like turning in on oneself, right? And and that's incomplete. The the male looking to the male, the female looking that's not that that you cannot apprehend humanity. You need both man and woman. It's complementary, which that complementary nature of, of male and female is what reveals what mankind is, right? Okay, so this reality of when we need the, when we begin to look towards Christ, both the husband and the wife, both looking in the direction of Christ and, and looking to kind of fulfill that, um, um, apprehension of him and that apprehension of him is is best understood as looking at the icon of Christ by looking at the icon of Christ we then begin to see what the icon of marriage needs to look like right and if we're looking at ourselves each other in the way that I was speaking about previously we're not apprehending what it means to be human if we're not apprehending what it means to be human we can't apprehend what it means to be married is any of this, are, you, are these dots mm -hmm. connecting, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, so once you get that, then you begin to understand the, the profounder kind of experience of what it means to be the church. Because now you're beginning, once you've done that, you begin to apprehend like, like what it means to be human, mankind, humanity. And that leads us to the other thing, which is the, the real, like, mind-blowing part, the divine. What does that mean? How, like, what, what does it mean? What, is, what does it mean to experience the divine? What does it mean to be actually in union and communion with the divine, theosis? You can't understand that without marriage. You can't. Sure. Like, full stop, period. Like, you can't, Right. Because there's something because there's something missing from the entire experience. Is that what we're saying? The entire Correct. experience of what it is to be human. There's something Correct. missing. I mean, Correct. love needs to go out. Like yeah, love needs to go out because this is the thing is what if you guys are what's well, not you guys, Cyprian and Andrew, but everyone, right? If you guys are following me, what should start coming into focus around the corner, we're not there yet, but around the corner is the Holy Trinity. If you're following where we're going right now, right? You start seeing like, oh, the end point of this is the Trinity. Sure. This, this is really important because we don't, we're not looking to project things, project Trinitarian meaning on things. It, it's quite the opposite. Where everything is being re is a revelation of that Trinitarian sure. experience, right? It has meaning because of the Trinity. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, this. And, and and this now leads us into what, right? Children, right? Procreation, all these things, right? So this, this understanding and the need to apprehend the connection between the experience of the icon, both in a kind of literal and metaphorical sense, right? And the, the ontological experience of being an icon, right? Um, these things, are, are like why marriage exists, what marriage is. Um, and I think that reality gets us into this space where we can start unpacking some of these other things because um, I think the issues that always, un the things that fundamentally undo this for us are, are our selfishness. There's this great quote by St. Paisius, I can't remember it verbatim, but essentially he says, you know, um, every single problem in a marriage, every single issue, you know, that leads to divorce, something to that effect is because of the refusal to see the other, you know? Um, one way that I try to put it is like, someone decides to stop serving the other. Um, and when you, Bob Dylan, you know, famously said on Slow Train and Coming, uh, you gotta serve somebody. It may be God, it may be the devil, but you're going to serve someone. And if you aren't serving the other in the image, likeness, and, and manifestation of the icon of Christ in the church, then you're going to be serving the devil uh, yourself in the world. 
And that's where people become, you know, addicted. This is where people become, you know, these twisted distortions of what it means to be themselves and to be human, to be, um, you know, fill in the blank, whatever your name is. Um, and your desires be begin to become this kind of demonstrous caricature of you. And so, so, so the root of disorder, so the root of the type of disorder that we're talking about is a, a self, a turning in on oneself, mm -hmm. as opposed to being oriented toward Christ and then through Christ to the rest of humanity or, yeah. or yeah, let me make a real bold statement. Yeah, please. Um, this is, I, I'm really big on this, like Christ and the church isn't kind of like one of many good options. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Uh, because what we're talking about doesn't make sense. And if it does make sense, it what a, what a, I mean, the horrific doom that you face if you begin to understand this and you don't have Christ. Like this is why Nietzsche went mad. Right. When you begin to understand these things and apprehend them, but refuse Christ, this is where people get lost because there Christ is the solution, not a solution, not the solution we prefer. You know, he's not the kind of like, do I want the generic, you know, day quill or do I want the like, like, no, 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 no. Like this is like Christ is the solution because what it means to experience, you can't experience life you know, as a monad, is just like yourself. Like you can't, it's impossible. No one can, no one does. And the closer that people begin to experience that, the closer they come to hell. And an experience of hell is an experience of madness, right? So this is, this is really key because then when you begin to see what's happening, um, the madness that we are descending into, not just with the confusion of gender, Right. But with the madness in which people have no regard for the sanctity of, of, of marriage as an icon, that that descent into madness that's facilitated and really caused by this turning in on self, but there's a step before the turning in on self that happens oftentimes, which is the idolatrous nature of looking towards the other person, because that's the other part of it, because you know, the thing about idolatry is that at the end of the day, it's fundamentally selfish. Like the idolater, if you're thinking about, let's, in the Charlton Heston sense of it, you know, the, the idolater doesn't care about Baal. The, the idolater doesn't care about Moloch. He's just going there because he wants something. You know, you worship Moloch and Moloch's, you know, you, you sacrifice your baby to Moloch. Moloch's going to give you freedom, luxury, and all these things. The quid, quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. Quid pro quo, yeah. God is the God of... The Holy Trinity, the revelation of the true God is not that. It isn't just you come to the to the God and he gives you, you know, you know, beauty and life and all that, but actually you can actually begin to love and care for for God himself too. Hmm. It's it seems like the I the the idea of the idol also is always that it gives me what I want. So it assumes that I actually want the right thing, mm -hmm. right? That my that I've actually discer discerned right. what what I should want in terms of this sustainable thing, which makes me think, Father, like you you say, Christ is the solution. But I think as an equivalence, it's also like the solution is Christ. So it's like the correct thing. Mm -hmm. Which, is Christ. Which, there, there is a single best yeah, thing, and yeah, it's Christ. Is, <laughs> and, and let me let me throw this though, because you said discern. So let me, I can't that I can discern what's best. What I, but here's here's another D word. This is the one that's even worse than discerning. Mm. That I deserve. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you see, because we all think that we deserve whatever. I'm mad at you because you're not meeting my emotional needs. I'm mad at you because you're not meeting my physical needs. I'm mad at you because blah, 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 blah. Like you deserve it. What if I was to tell you, you don't deserve it. What if I was to tell you, you actually deserve the pain and misery that you are sitting in. 
right? Oh man, writ large right now. Okay. I think that that what okay. you're saying right there is That's like okay. maybe you deserve it. Okay. <laughs> maybe you maybe deserve, you what's deserve happening. it. Maybe you deserve it. And now watch this. This is why, oh man, oh, I love God. He's so great. Uh that's why God is incredibly merciful and humble because he's like, yeah, you deserve this, but look what I give you instead. Or, yeah. or, or here's the other thing. This is the real problem that we're facing in our generation. You deserve it and I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> right. Someone was asking me about like, what do I do about my kids? They want to like be in Christ. Blah, blah. I said, ah, don't get in the way of their suffering. Yeah. Right. The hardest thing to do, like this is like, right? Say this all the time. The hardest thing about being a father is like your kids are going to hate you at some point in time if you're doing your job right. Sure. And so like, because remember, people got all kinds of Christ, small C, but it's not the true Christ. They got the Christ that's giving them what they want. The sure. real Christ that loves you gives you what you don't want. And in fact, gives you what you deserve sometimes because out of love. You deserve this difficult thing right now because I love you. Boom. There you go. Right? The key shorthand symbol that we're talking about is is communion. Hmm. We can enter into communion with the with our God. All the other gods, Allah, which that's a tough one because Allah just means God. And yeah. So like people, if they're like any Antiochian church, not just speaking Arabic, they'll hear that. Be like, what is this? It's like it's just it means God, but Allah in the sense of Islam. Allah in the gods in regards of Islam is capricious. He doesn't care about you. Doesn't care. You, you're you're insignificant. If you if if Allah is, 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 forgive me, Father, is Allah would would we as Orthodox would we say that Allah, as expressed by the Muslims, is a small G God? Is an actual is a is a power. I would a demon I just... maybe. I mean, are they are they talking about something that is? What are so, they talking about? Are they talking about a th uh, an entity? Yeah, I mean, I, it was great. Uh, father, uh, father uh, John, who I was just speaking with earlier, he was bringing up a great point, which you know many have made the same observation. When you look at Muhammad and his revelation, his receiving revelation, Gabriel is demon possession. Yeah, yeah. One hundred percent. There's mean, no question. One hundred percent. I mean, I mean it's, it's demon possession, right? So so yeah, you know. Um now the, the great thing is is that um there's there's so many there's so many good people that happen to be Muslims and you know, may God continue to have you know, may God have mercy on them, you know. But like we've talked about before, and hopefully people can hear this. We're not talking about Muslims. We're talking about Islam. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so, not, Catholics. not the Catholics, but the Catholic Church. You know, yeah, exactly. The Protestants, but the Protestants. Exactly. You know what I mean? So that's just important to, to say because what I'm about to say will hopefully soften the blow for people. But like, yeah, you know, like what the Quran is putting forward is some high level demon <laughs> you know what i mean it's not it's not forgive me it's not it's 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 not god no you know I mean? so there's no um, new revelation like christ was like it is finished i yeah. you know there's there's nothing new like i'm not gonna start something new so. yeah um yeah. well sorry if you have something to say go ahead sir go ahead so i think I think the Muslims must be coming or something because they just keep coming up. Like they just keep kind of coming up right now. And I think it's in the air father, because I was actually just talking about something about what you deserve with someone earlier today. Um, because I was kind of trying to explain to him a very a guy I'm working with. who's really curious about some of the Orthodox stuff. He says his dad was Orthodox and he's kind of trying to get back into it. Um, so uh, I've been talking to him a little bit about it, but I can uh, that I feel qualified to talk to. Um, and we were talking about like um, the actual state of like when people say like, I'm in hell. Well, like, yeah, you are. 
you are in hell right now like the the existence like the at, when you're at your lowest in your addiction and you were telling people like i feel like i'm in hell right now and i'm like well you kind of are like you are in hell and this is the thing this is what's happening to you and the worst part of it is is like you kind of deserve it you kind of deserve what's happening to you right now and it's out of god's love that he's allowing this to happen so all of that is to loop it back to what we were originally going to try and talk about was um so missouri just passed uh that weed is now marijuana is now legal recreationally and um and i'm going to give my two cents real quick on this and then um I will allow father to say it better and more, you know, in tune with God. But the way that I see it, this play out a lot is um, the true dangers of where this stuff comes into play. And especially with relation with marriage and with relationship with other people is, is um, certainly within the last gen couple of generations without a doubt, but more so now I would say anybody like 40 and under has gotten really used to instant gratification They've gotten really, really used to, they played video games or watched a lot of TV growing up. Um, and that kind of uh, gave them set off all the right, you know, parts of their brain that they needed to. Uh, and then that can lead into, you know, maybe, you know, these are interchangeable, but porn, then, um, then drugs, you know, either, you know, whichever comes first, whichever comes first, whichever comes first. And um, what ends up happening is they end up as then they're, thrown through the gutter they're thrown through the meat grinder and then they're spit out in front of me and i talked to him about what what happened during their drug addiction and everything like that and um i know i've grown because uh i used to be on the other side of this issue but it's like so much of it starts with pot like so much of it starts with this introduction to pot about how like it's portrayed as this innocent thing you know how could it really hurt you you know because nobody is out you know, crashing cars or whatever, or beating their wives or whatever, or um, stealing money while high on pot. And well, first off, that's not true. And second off, like, that's not, that's not the real, the real problem. And one of the things I bring up and give me like 30 more seconds is, is that about six months into my recovery, I relapsed, I started drinking again. And then I never wanted to go back to the way I was feeling at that time. Turns out I did need to go back to that feeling. Um, and so I smoked pot for about the next nine months or something like that. I didn't drink, but I went to meetings, I smoked pot and, um, you know, and that was about it. And the thing that I found was, is that, um, it's never really that big into pot, but, uh, I suddenly needed to be high all the time. Like I needed, like, I was never really awake and baked dude, but I suddenly started to need to be like. Like I had to be at a job at 5 30 in the morning and you better believe I was high almost every day that I went there. Like there's no need for that. Now like, they call it medicated. So that's the whole thing about it is now the narrative has changed. The narrative has changed and suddenly it's medication, just like abortion is healthcare. Um, you know, um, ding, 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 chicken wing. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, I, so the problem is, is that there was no spiritual growth ever my entire life when I'm encountering a passion that is clearly like a very big thing that God needs to get out of the way. My entire life becomes at all times justifying the use of that thing. Like there is nothing else. Anytime I start to approach God, anytime there's prayer, that topic always comes up over and over and over again. It's the pot. It's the pot. No, I use the pot for this. That's the pot. It's the pot. And over and over again, I have to justify its use. And that's one of my red flags to know that, that my behavior is now becoming problematic, that there's something I need to look at. Um, and pot was definitely one of those things. So my final thing I'll say is, is, is that pot has gotten to the point now um, where it's aiding in this instant gratification. So somebody is not doing something for me. If reality is not doing something for me, then I need to change it. And I think I can't exactly make the connective tissue between the two other than the vague way I just did. But I know that pot is hugely responsible for the fact that like people need things to be mind blowing at all times. They need like the over the top feelings that come the like the hypnotic aspects of pot that lure you into like experiencing music on a corner. You need to escape. It's an escape. It's it's in it's an escape and it's an enhancer as well. 
and like I talk about feelings that no human being was meant to really feel at that time and like you know sure I think I'm going to stop there I think I'm going to stop there and let you guys I the the enhancement thing is interesting because it while it enhances it also desensitizes and I think that's what you're talking about Andrew is that like I have noticed that like every like I've smoked I've smoked a lot of pot in my life but the thing about me is it's I'm super susceptible to it so it's highly psychedelic for me yeah and so I can't actually smoke it that often but the thing that I wanted to say and maybe this and and maybe father you could talk about this a little bit because it's the thing that I think is missing from this conversation and this comes from like so the medicine thing the fact that it first always is medical like there's a spiritual element to that that's hidden occult in it because it is plant medicine and there is a spirit like the the woman who was my entree into ayahuasca organized ceremonies for years is now a shaman um you know she talks openly about the spirit of of cannabis she yeah. says the spirit is ganja i mean she's a so she's like a, a shaman a plant medicine person and for for within that space every single one of these plants is a spirit it's not chemical. It's not any of the, every single one is a God or a demon, if you will. Right. And so she's like, here's ganja. Here's her personality. When she talks about these plants, she talks about them as the God, God the small G gods. There you go. I'll let father just go <laughs> on this. I didn't because- hear what father said. What'd you say, father? <laughs> Tobacco is one too. Tobacco oh. is absolutely. So, so forgive me, you know, whatever. Uh, God, I keep dancing closer and closer to the edge, but. Um, you know, just whatever, not to scandalize anyone. You know, my very first spell, very first, was a was was a work against the spirit of tobacco. Very first one, you know, that kind of like broke me in. So when you okay, so this is part of the problem with like materialism, right? Because it says that like these things just are what they are at face value and they're not, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and even, and even the people who, one of the great things about right now is like, you can find people um, that are new age, you know, um, occultists, uh, fill in the blank, whatever. And they'll just say like, yeah, this is what it is, you know? Um, and we can agree. We 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 disagree on the kind of like endpoint of it, but we'll agree. Kind of like the thing with um, you know, the cult roots of feminism and stuff like that. There's that great that one lady. She's been doing a lot of great work. Whatever we're talking about is uh, it's fascinating because she's like one of her biggest um, kind of supporters of her work is someone who's like fundamentally on the other side of you know um, worldviews. You know, what I mean, the, this lady. She's a Orthodox mom, blah, 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 whatever. And one of the one of her great proponents of her work is full on screaming banshee, you know, occultist feminist who's like, yeah, everything you're saying is true. Like it, the roots of it are are occult for sure. And she thinks it's great. <laughs> you know what I mean? She's like, yeah, 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 this has always been witchy and it's great. So it's it's the same thing when you know the hardest thing for people to get um and getting kind of back into like a practical aspect of it's like you know i mean thanks be to god it's it's people are doing better but like you know talking to people about like um marijuana use specifically talking about that but everything else marijuana use is not compatible with a communing christian like if you're using marijuana like you should not be communing you're you're at the table of demons (laughs) like like you're you're you are turning to something else for all the things that you should be turning to God for, right? You want to have some sort of like transcendental state. You want, you know what I mean? Let's let's go through all the things you want. Relax. You want you want to be at peace. Like all that stuff, right? Well, when I'm doing, I had some. I have this one person, you know, who, who told me, well, you know, you want to argue with me. Well, I just, you know, I'm getting, I get into the space and this and this and that. You know, I just feel more prayerful and this and that. So I said, oh, so. You're telling me that unless you are ingesting this substance, you can't pray and you can't experience God. 
who who are you what are you experiencing in prayer mm. that's the question so like what are you what are you praying to then what's so, your trick to your deceit so 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 mm. i would and, and this is the thing i've always said to people whatever like i'm speaking from experience i'm not speaking from i gotta like say this because i'm a priest i gotta tell some line i'm just telling you like the reason why i know that that's the case is because i did it yeah I lived exactly. it. Exactly. It was my life. You know what I mean? It was my life, you know? Um, I mean, I spent years looking down on the people I would, you know, the, it's the hypocrisy. Pride, one of the fruits of pride is hypocrisy and contradiction. You know, people contradict themselves. If I, it's, it's it's a direct fruit of pride. But, you know, in my, in my pride, my hypocrisy, I would, you know, be smoking with people doing whatever and looking down on them. Like, oh. These people just want to party, but I know, you know, I'm really doing, I'm doing the real work. Sure. I'm doing the real work, you know? And so, yeah, delusion, pride, that's all there. But like at the end of the day, that's, that's what's up. So I think the, I think the, the other thing that's kind of like, man, if we want to have a good entertaining time tonight, you know, let's just kind of like open up some, some, some ideas, you know, what does it look like? How do you facilitate a mass experience? You know, when people do ayahuasca, or though sometimes this happens also with shroom trips, people will begin to experience phenomena together. Oh yeah, our oh. my first trip, my wife and I would get scared Absolutely. and happy at the same time. I've, I've 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 in an ayahuasca ceremony, four people in the same ceremony witnessed the spirit of a shaman walk through the middle of the ceremony and all of us were like who was that person who and they were like oh you mean the one in the black cloak like kind of down like this and they were like i thought that was and it was like and then another person said you saw that too and it was like yeah right when they were doing this song they were like that per and it's like, and like, this okay, is eyes whatever, open you whatever know? you know <laughs> Maybe this will be one of those kind of entertaining moments for people, but like, let me just throw something out there. It's not just, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And, you know, there's, there's Orthodox Religion of the Future, Blessed Sarah from Rose, uh, Father Spirit on Bailey's done some great work in regards to UFO phenomena, talking about other things. Like there's there's these Orthodox, they're not many, but there's a couple sources you can get to to get into this. And I, I bring this up, I bring them up because they're the safer roads. But believe me when I tell you, there's many others that aren't as safe where you get into, you know, what are some of the things that we can expect to see. Um, and there's just a lot of dangerous stuff that you can begin to swallow in with these kind of predictions, whatever, from other authors and other sources. I say all that to say this, it does, it, it isn't just about like the wheat. It's also about the, the pharmaceuticals, pharmakia, mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. big pharma. That's not just about the money, although it's about money. But the thing is, is like, when you start messing with the fundam fundamentally the way that the human being is orientated and you start putting you start getting in there and messing with the receiver for what for what purpose sure what, what are we trying to be dialed into and for what you know what i mean and well, this the amphetamines gets, with the children father forgive me like the amphetamine no, just given all these millions billions no, of kids amphetamines that, that's ex that's exactly it and anyone who's been around amphetamines anyone who's been around meth anyone who's been around tweakers you know that there's a spirit there without a doubt you know that it has its, oh. its own particular its own particular spirit i'll give you i'll give you some low-hanging fruit you'd see certain cats around here in midtown who i knew when i was working at a certain nonprofit, especially working with a, that population a lot more closely like why is it that you would see certain cats like come in and out of quote unquote, their schizophrenic remission, quote unquote, their use of drugs. And they're doing similar things. Like what I mean by that is like crazy, crazy, crazy outfits, like dressing really similar certain things, which are just like, 
what that doesn't make any sense you know we're not talking about like fashion or we're talking about there was a spirit there oh yeah like these are things that um people are really unaware of and like this is this is the big trope with like conspiracy theories and blah 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 but the fact of the matter is if just you have life experience and you start looking at patterns this is this is the thing so there's also another pattern, right? I feel like we've said this before, but like there's another pattern. It's the pattern of the church. And that pattern is revealed in the saints. The pattern is revealed in the scriptures. The pattern is revealed in the life of repentance. And that pattern, you know, there's there's all these, there's, a, there's you know, I want to say myriad because there's, you know, there's lots of saints, but it's not kind of infinite in regards of who's been revealed to us. But there's there's these patterns and there, there are a multitude of them pathways but the kind of patterns always converge to this one singular pattern when we're in regards of holiness and sanctifi- you know sanctification repentance all that stuff it works both ways and so you're not going to find that pattern with the use of sorcery you just you're not you're you don't you're not going to find that pattern because you're not in the ethos it's not the same song it's yeah. just it's not it's not in this it's not the same chord basically it's you just have no dissonant. Yeah. So you know, I think I talked about this before, but I always thought since my brother dying of opiates that was going to be my group of people I really related to. But no, it's actually people who've used a lot of math. And I think I've talked about this before because you can tell them my whole thing is okay. This is a, your addiction is a spiritual malady. Oh, see. Um, yeah, they're like, oh yeah. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm there. Like the devil's real. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, and they then, see the devil. This is like so I know is, meth heads who have told me. Oh no, no, no. I've not only have I seen the devil, I've talked to the devil. Yeah. yeah. There's. Yeah. This, I've I've interacted with that. He used yeah. to show up all the time, and we would have conversations. Yep. There's this guy who uh, him and his wife were using together, and they used, and he went to work, and when he came back, the children was, were being watched by grandma, and um, they're like, "Where is your mom?" And they all pointed at the attic. And she was up there and she could hear, even though he was at work, she could hear him up in the attic with another woman. And she was crawling through the insulation by the time that they found her. And like, yeah. like when you talk to people, this is just a common thing. They're like, oh, yeah, demons can throw their voice. They're like telling me. They're like, oh, yeah, demons can throw their voices. They can impersonate people. They can show up like this other guy I know said that he stood inside his apartment and he was or he was looking out his window and he saw three of his friends sitting outside all talking crap about him all talking about him behind his back and he was getting so pissed and then he saw them later and they're like i haven't been near your apartment all day long and he's like but i saw them and he's like that's too much sleep that's doing meth for you know 36 hours straight i'm like no bro no 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 but it's not either or but that's right it's and not, it's both and. It's both it's and. Because that's both. the whole point. That's the whole point. When people go, like, no, blah, blah, blah. It's all chemical reactions, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, it is. It's both and, right? <laughs> sure. sure. Yeah. Because the question is where, it's it's funny because this same, uh, I it, it's it's not funny. It's exactly what it is. I was, but uh, Joe Rogan had Graham Hancock and uh randall what's his name randall carlson on talking about uh you know uh graham's uh you know his uh his theory about the ancient civilizations and everything which is pretty cool but he's a big like proponent of the psychedelics right but he's also a big materialist you know so he's like you know psychedelics what's that i owe a lot to to Oh yeah, and, and and kind of like bad, mostly bad, but like, yeah, you know what I mean. I mean, he's he's been he's he's definitely been a he's the been a force, the but he is very much advocating for psychedelics. But he even brought up, and this was something that I learned very early on in the ayahuasca community. You know, he brought up the fact that you know when they would go and ask ayahuasca shamans, you know, there's a hundred thousand different plants in the Amazon. And it's two very specific ones in order to get the ayahuasca brew and make the thing happen. And they asked the ayahuasca shamans, well, in your tradition, like who, how did, how is this even possible? Stone age, how did you find this? And they're like, oh, no, no. Well, the shamans were doing a, a snuff 
that had DMT in it, basically. It's a, it's a, it's a snuff. And they said when they did the snuff, the spirits told them mm-hmm. how to make ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. The, spirit, the spirit that was in there said, take this plant and take this plant, mm-hmm. cook it in this way, and you'll have ayahuasca. And then it's like, well, extend that out to big pharma. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. The, mm-hmm. the guy who the guy who made um, ecstasy, MDMA, right. Alexander Shulgin, he used to work for Merck and he invented some great drug for them. And so they told him, I just go off in your Northern California. We'll build you a lab. We'll give you this money. Go through all the archives. See if you can find something good. And he made basically 40 designer drugs. And that's where like all the stuff that came after ecstasy comes from. And he wrote two books about this process. Right. And and it's like a narrative about him creating it. And it just falls into these same ideas of like everybody that's getting, where does it come? He's like, Oh, and then I was just doing this. And then God inspired. He was trying to make basically synthetic mushrooms. And in a mushroom trip, he was given the information about like to combine. And it's just like, dude, (laughs) what more do you need? Yeah. What I more mean, do you need? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, this, this is this is the thing, right? And this gets back to like, um, you know, God comes to us, and everything that the world has has conditioned us to be against, you know, sacrifice, chastity, humility, gentleness, faithfulness, um, joy peace all those things like that's boring that's boring i don't want that you know what i mean um and all these things i mean it's pride it's vanity right it's it's lust it's all it's it's all the passions all the stuff is the passions you know it's like we want to be gods and the demons know this the spirits know this you know and the thing is is this this is why it's so sad and tragic when you leave your body, you, your soul will experience the greatest, you know, you know, I, I have to use the term for the context of the conversation, the greatest high. You will experience it. You'll experience such freedom. You'll see things, hear things, experience things that you never could really fully experience in your body. And for many people, because they neglected their soul, that moment will be the most tragic of all. Because what they've been chasing their whole life, they'll experience it the first time, but instead of it being bliss and absolute wonder and worship and thanksgiving, it's gonna be terror and remorse because they'll see for the first time and the, the deadening and the tricking and the lying and the substitution and all the things that the demons gave them and they drank heartily. These are the things that's gonna be able to keep their soul to perceive and to experience that period of time until their resurrection. What should be something wondrous will be terrifying. And this is is a real shame because this is the same thing for any of it. For those of us who enter into marriage, And even if we don't enter into marriage as Christians, those of us who seek to make our our marriages Christian, our marriages Orthodox, that experience will reveal to us. It's the tutor. It's the symbol that reveals the ultimate. And we'll Mm -hmm. we'll have been trained and, and conditioned to experience the ultimate, to receive what is overwhelming in a way that will not destroy us, but rather fulfill us. Because as vessels, our souls will be prepared to receive that revelation. Yeah. Those of us who did not, who just used our wives as vessels of pleasure or used our husbands as, you know, vessels of whatever, you know, security or like self-reflection, like all of these things and any type of idolatrous sense, the marriage will become a weight to us. It'll become a thing in which our souls were never truly able to begin to you know, kind of stretch their wings and experience this and be prepared for the journey. Same thing with with pharmaceuticals. Same thing with pharmaceuticals. Now, let's just be clear. Unfortunately, because of the way that the world is, the fallen nature, because of people's, you know, fleshly orientation, you know, there are people at times will, you know, do benefit from medication. But the problem always is the medication is the end of itself and not the means. 
I, I just want to throw in here real quick to avoid despondency, maybe in some people. I take ADHD medication, like, and I've and I've not taken it before, and I can't function as a student. Once my student days are done, I'm gonna re reevaluate that relationship. But it it absolutely has to be a means to an end. It can't be like now the problem isn't the medication in that sense. Just like anything else, it's like the diabetic needs the insulin. You know what I mean? Like we can we can pull it apart. God has given, uh, it says in Sirach, God's given uh, physicians wisdom, you know? But the problem always is, is the idolatrous nature. Mm. And to look at the things as the end and not the means. And that gets into a whole thing. I'm sorry, Father, I cut you off. But there's something like, I know someone who is currently quitting their uh, uh, their their medication, their depression medicine. And the side effects from that thing are so intense and so overwhelmingly negative it's like why are we putting this stuff in people's bodies and the thing is wait from the withdrawal or from the actual from the withdrawal the brain zaps brain zaps shaking fevers hormone imbalances so like you know just like all over the place like like this person that i'm talking about ha is, has gone through actual withdrawal and this is worse for them this is worse for them like they say that this is much more intense than their alcohol and Xanax withdrawal, which by the way, those are the two bad ones. Those are the ones like you can't just quit that stuff by yourself. You might want to medically detox if you're actually DTing and everything like that when you don't take that stuff. And the false promises that is like held for people who like say that, no, these medications, they are the end. This is the thing that helps you. This is the thing because, and there's a phrase that, is um, uttered a lot by people who are not doing well in their recovery and who are overly relying on these medicines that I just need to adjust my meds a bit. My meds aren't working. I just need to adjust them. So it's like well, look your at Jordan Peterson. This is what happened to Jordan Peterson. Huh? Yeah. That's exactly. That's interesting. They had to put him in a coma in Russia because it's with because the withdrawals. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Those benzos are no shirt. joke. I mean, he's on those benzos. This is no joke, you know benzos are that they're taught everywhere you know i i have the same bachelors that father does that father does and it's very much like those are the two things that they continually emphasize over and over and over again benzos and alcohol those are two you don't mess around with every other one you're gonna get sick but you'll get over it you know and, you know and i don't mean to downplay that but medically assisted treatment is such a thing right now they're offering um certain medications i don't want to say them in lieu of heroin or in lieu of opiates and they're just so willing to dish it out they're just so willing and people nod off on that stuff it's just government heroin i mean people sit and nod off when they're on it and it's just like like i don't think i could have ever quit heroin without this stuff and it's like well and there's a spirit there's a spirit there too the ancients definitely knew the spirit of the poppy i mean there's poppy oh. <laughs> poppy gods in so many different cultures yep. yeah they Ruth were well part. aware of that one a ruthless well person. aware yeah so um Bing, bang, boom. <laughs> uh, so oh oh God. the dragon that's right oh that's right and who are the children of the dragon and that's who's right. the kind of with fentanyl right now that's right that's right um, Bing, bang, um, boom where is iron man when you need him because it isn't isn't fin fang boom isn't that an iron man enemy it doesn't matter. Uh, this is time for this is a discussion for a different time. Um, so, um, Father, I I wanted to see kind of like spiritually. I I talk about this with people, but you would be much more eloquent at what the spiritual process of an addiction when an addiction starts, what that looks like spiritually. I know you've talked about idolatry and everything, but say Johnny starts smoking pot at thirteen tries you know pills 15 you know is it hooked by 18 blah 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 what spiritually does that look like and maybe maybe for the benefit of this particular podcast maybe johnny's orthodox like i don't know like because it would probably be different for an orthodox person than just a regular person but i don't know if we want to stick to that but like could what we define addiction we could do it in any context i mean whether it's a spiritual context or whatever but it's just yeah. like Father, what is the point where you are addicted and then you are not addicted? Like, that's what I'm most interested in is like, 
I know. One, there's got to be one day when you're not addicted, and then you then there's a the next day you are addicted, or is that not the yeah, case? Yeah, when does like, that what's cup the, overturn? Um, when does the cup overturn? Well, I'll I'll just chime in, and then Father can um, do much better job at it. But I think it's the addiction. I don't know if the cup duff like just happened to overflow at a certain time. I think a certain choice has to be made. Um, I know for me, I got to a crossroads and I definitively made the decision. I'm going to chase an addiction. Like, and I don't know if that was one particular night or if that was a time in my life where I kind of continually had to make that decision over and over again. And then the last thing is, um, a compulsive like behavior with consequences like that's when an addiction is like when you can objectively look at a person who is unable to stop like the big book talks about a person who's compulsively addicted to jumping out in traffic and the bill w and dr bob use a, a, a um intentionally use like an absurd example because that's the insanity of the addiction to the person who's so i don't get gambling addiction myself i know i would absolutely become addicted to gambling why would you go to a casino and pour thousands of dollars and never get anything back or win 700 and lose 5,000 and you think you came out ahead? You know, like, I don't get that, but that's not out of a place of judgment. I would be one of those people without a doubt. Like someone bought me a lottery ticket one time and I felt the power. I was like, oh yeah, I can't do this. And I had to give it back to him. But like, Bill W and Dr. Bob specifically chose the jumping out in traffic. First time they're like, wow, that was crazy. Why'd you do that? Third or fourth time they're in the hospital from getting run over by a car, or hit by a car, or whatever. Like, and the person's like, I want to stop. I cannot stop. That's kind of like the addiction kind of plays out in a way of like a compulsive behavior that the person is not able to stop doing despite extremely negative con or somewhat negative consequences. Um, so that's I'm done. I'm stepping off my soapbox. And then... and that's got to be a spiritual thing. Like just to, on its face, you hear that and you're like, well, that's from, a spiritual problem. From a counseling perspective, that's how I always approach it. I'm just like, yeah, the psychological, the emotional, all that stuff is there without a doubt. It's there, but it's a byproduct of a spiritual addiction or of a spiritual malady. And an addiction is a demon. It's, it's like it's a, a specific demon with a specific agenda that does specific things in order to continue to entice you to the gates of hell you know it continually entices you with false promises and then when you start to break down what that addiction looks like you start to see it you know all over the place you see it in shopping you see it in food you see it in and continually reinventing yourself continually chasing an identity over and over and over again so but if you could give a little bit more insight than i got father on what that looks like and what what you know what might be the undercurrents of the spiritual nature of addiction? Yeah. Wow. Um, um, I think, I think there's two things. One, I'm kind of uncomfortable saying because I was just, I just had this conversation last week and I was like, I don't know, you know, people are ready to hear, hear this one. So I don't know. We'll see what the other one will kind of like, uh, so I think one of the things that will help us is um, when we're when we say spiritual in this context, we really need to like not have the dichotomies. So spiritual should be shorthand for the whole person, because the the chasing of the tail ah. that happens is like well, there's the emotional the physical psychological and then there's and no no that is that is the spirit it's the whole person it's the whole being right because so, well, forgive me father but the only question that i have on this is but it is a sum that's greater than the parts right so it's not just like you take the physical and the emotional and the psychological and you put them together and that's the spiritual it's like the spiritual is here and all of those things are inside, right? Correct. Or am I misunderstanding what you're no, saying? Correct. Yes. So correct. the spiritual is, so there's, there's still a realm that when we say spiritual, that is like more than the, the sum of just the, those other parts. Yeah. Physical, emotional. Yeah. I mean, because when we say spiritual, what we talk about sometimes is, and you know, I'm just saying, I'm just trying to help all of us like navigate these things. When we say spiritual, 
what we kind of often mean or we have in our mind is something moral. But it isn't that, right? So addiction is not a more addiction is not a morality problem although a person will develop addiction because of morality you see what i'm saying or lack thereof so it's it's important to just get that out in the out there first is that we're talking about spiritual it's the whole system not just one aspect right because you know we've talked about this but you know the core thing the the physio the somatic right psychosomatic the somatic aspect of addiction is very real and in, in the way that people's um inner life both their emotional and you know intellectual um insight ability to kind of like you know operate as God intended is compromised because of that because of that physical component it becomes so great that's the insanity the insanity gets that the insanity comes from the the kind of fixing the crystallizing seeming crystallizing of that inverted state where the the somatic the physical is the thing running the show and so it dictates it, it becomes a tyrant and so the passions they become the person's not passing these things and so those physical things they're they, they are calling the shots so this is why you will at times need you will with you know addiction need these physical interventions but that's spiritual right because you know how do you tell a guy to get off porn without telling him to stop you know don't pick up the phone don't put your hand down there you know what i mean not to take explicit but like like there's physical realities and interventions that are necessary for that quote unquote spiritual problem, right? The spirit. So it's not just an issue, an inward issue. It's the issue of the whole person, right? Sure. Because we're not Gnostics. We're not Gnostics, right? So, so that physical part, that's the first thing. Then there's the psychological aspect in regards of the thoughts of the, the thoughts of the psyche, the, the thoughts of, of the mind as they are experienced and filtered through the organ of the brain, Right, because there's thoughts that of that are originating from the brain, that, and there are thoughts that are originating. The thoughts originate from the inner being, right? The heart, they're experienced and filtered through the brain, the organ of the brain, and the brain. The brain's compromised through chemicals. It can affect the 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 signal, and and also what the content of the signal is. Because there's two things: there's the signal, and there's the content of the signal. Does that make sense? Yes. So think of it as like there's the lightning and the color of the lightning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's where the brain is. So that's also an aspect. But then we start getting even deeper, and it's like, and this is the part that's really hard because we have all kinds of terms that we use, and it's fine. It's just where our society's at, you know. And they're all in. They're all in one way or another used by God but but not originating from him right because psychology counseling like all this stuff is kind of what's needed for a godless society <laughs> you know what I mean sure um but the core thing of it somewhere somehow whether it originates within you or whether it originates in your mom when you're in her womb, or whether it originates with her dad or her mom, and like you see what I'm saying, there's a lack of acceptance. That's that's where it begins. Acceptance of what? Lack of acceptance of what? There's a lack of acceptance of one's circumstance. Yeah. There's an experience that happens and the inability to accept it that then becomes a seed you know this is where I, we all hate the word whatever but like i'm going to use it in the proper sense trauma the inability to properly process some sort of experience right that's what becomes you know 
that's what constitutes a traumatic experience, which, which then constitutes a prolonged and at times because of the prolonged nature of it, distorted reaction. That distorted reaction, which fundamentally is a lack of acceptance, then begins to facilitate certain psychosomatic processes, behaviors. Such, such Those as prolonged psychosomatic processes and behaviors then begin over time, if they're not, if there is an intervention, they become, um, in some people, personality disorders, in some people, addictions, um, in some people, cancers, in some people, blah, 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 blah. Sure. But that root, that seed, fundamentally is a lack of acceptance. So always. always. So what's that process on a on a on a very, very, very broad uh picture? What what's like a very broad way of like it because the way I've kind of seen it in the last couple of years of me were trying to repent a little bit more of my like um um so sent I guess like uh I'll just say woke ways if that's a little bit anyway uh trying to repent of that is is a little bit of like maybe it's throwing out the baby with the bathwater a little bit of like do we go back and find a way to process that or is that just a cross we have to bear now of like so for example like um i have a hard time say with intimacy like i have a hard time with intimacy because like my parents you know maybe there was some stuff going on there maybe there's some stuff going on with the partner i had at some time maybe you know there's a past sexual trauma or something like that like does that does that work does that mean we go back and work through that find a way to process it or we do we just kind of move on learning to counteract there was a time there was there was a time and i mean i don't know how much time we have for this you know there were like yeah, like you know, 45 half hour 45 left okay good i'm not because I'm, I'm not being facetious when i say that because this is this is you know like there was a time that, okay so there's a reality, at least in the Western world, but I would dare submit that it's becoming global because I see more and more these cats. I'll see interviews with cats from Romania, um, from from one of the from one of the kind of like stands, whatever stands, you know, China. Like having, they're starting to have these same problems that kids in the West are having. Even even if it's even if it's high functioning, like having philosophical issues, blah blah blah, right? But there's a reality that children like the maturity level of of children and moving into like adulthood is extending mm, arrested like the maturity, the, the, maturity the, the development of maturity is, is it's extending are you following me like that's that's measurable like we could we could look at that and see that right the interpretation of it's subjective but it's measurable in the sense that like when you see um it isn't just an economic issue. It isn't just that people can't sustain like their own apartment, whatever, say so live in mom's basement. It isn't just that, right? This idea of kids holding parents hostage, like with their emotional fits and these things like that, right? I I'm going somewhere with this, right? So like- Can I ask real quick, just to make sure I understand where you're at so far, is, is that you're saying that like the- the quote unquote like arrested development, meaning that a child has stopped developing at a certain point, the emotional immaturity is getting worse in other places besides America. Is that right. what you're trying to trying to say? Right. Okay. We're, probably, we're the great we're the great culprits of it. Oh yeah. We're the but, pioneers. We're leading the way. But, but I just like, want to make sure I understood what you're saying. Yeah. But and that and that this seed of uh, unwillingness to accept something is Bingo. that that seed is like a an anchor Bingo. It's kind of thing okay. and it isn't just regional it's generational it isn't just generational right like it, it goes beyond that because he, here's the thing and what i mean by generational i don't mean generational like grandpa granddad whatever also think of a generation as like a spirit of an age sure sure right? so getting back to what your original thing was like, okay, like the wokey thing, blah, blah, like that's, we can go so many places with that because I've been thinking a lot about this too in regards of like, 
the platform, the way to explain it, because I really want to talk about this at some point in time, although I don't know if this is the right place because it might hijack it, but like there's this thing of an issue not being addressed, not being accepted, not being looked at, not being repented of. The response for that could, you know, brings about something else. And then, you know, and, and it becomes this cycle, right? Because, and try to bring me back to the cycles. I don't want to get stuck on this, but I just want to say that, you know, one of the big problems right now, which is again, purpose of the Royal Path Project is like, pe people just look at the insanity of the woke stuff and they think there was nothing there. No, there was something there. There was there were real issues that were there that there's this window of time which becomes smaller and smaller so you can't catch it that isn't capitalized on properly in Christ and then it causes these distortions, right? Okay. One of the easiest ways to understand what I'm talking about is like racism, right? Yeah. So it's like everyone's sick of BLM, everyone's sick of this and that, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is like 90, let's say, let's even say 99% of white privilege and that that trope is like whatever. But there's a 1% truth to that. 1%, yeah, yeah. That was used to begin the whole, you know, cascading event of like terribleness, right? But that 1% is still there, right? And so, in order to really kind of like deal with it, it has to be addressed, but now it's going to have to be addressed individually. Like we passed a, we, we passed a moment where it could have been addressed in Christ, but instead it was addressed antichrist, you know, you had all these BLM people making, you know, white people beg and all that stuff and like guilt. That's not repentance. That's just guilt. Right. But public repentance, national repentance is a real thing, but a lot of people, I mean, I remember leading up to all this. I remember basically like 2009 to till about 2014 having like like heated debates with people about like, no, 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 national repentance. And a lot of people were like, no, no, there's not a thing. I was like, look, Dostoevsky, look, the Russians, look, regicide, all these things. That is a thing. Public repentance is, you know, national. National repentance is a thing, Right. And we had an opportunity for it. But the thing is, our culture is not sacramental. It's not Orthodox. It's not Catholic. And so there was no way for a Protestant culture to repent of the things that need to be repent of. So it's, it's yeah. this really weird trap. Like, that's the thing. We can go down a whole other road. But I want to kind of get back to this other portion before I, before I lose it. Forget it. So, like, <clears throat> so getting back to, like, this thing of, okay, like, well, what do we do? Well, how do we see it? See, the problem is, is that in the older times, just the nature of how life worked, life, the process functioned function in such a way that a person was, a person, if a person that they just kind of like lived their life, those things would be processed through the toil and the struggle and the suffering ah. kind of collectively of life, okay. right? But okay. because we've moved away from those things, right? We are no longer able because it's 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 like we are like the retarded we we are like the retarded we <laughs> we're like a child that has become retarded both emotionally and physically because of an accident that has left us in like in a wheelchair like we're not able to use our muscles you see what i'm saying it's like all those things because of the lack of use proper use no longer function like they should does that yeah make sense? sure then, the luxury the you know therapy is a big portion of this therapy is really toxic i know this amen. is how people hear this man amen. i'm sorry everybody but like therapy for the most part is a very toxic thing because what it can what it does for most people is it removes some of the very organic um ex it removes the ability to engage like the normative god ordained experiences in a way that will like facilitate this processing that you're talking about so therapy too many times causes someone to like stare at the wound pick at the wound not exercise certain aspects by which just naturally those things that were that are causing the lack of acceptance would 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 they would grow out of that and 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 develop yeah. the, the proper emotional yes faculties well it's the, it's the end forgive me father it's the end as opposed to the means right it be yes. the therapy becomes the end yes. thing yes. if i had an if i had an air horn 
I would be like, because like yeah. everything father said is just like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so the thing is, is like, you know, our society needs therapists and, you know, I, I know, you know, a couple of good therapists, you know, Hey, shout out, God bless you. you. We've already been through this. So, you know, it's all good. But like the reality of it is though, is that, you know, it's a, con- it's a, it's a condescending, you know what I mean? It's not the ideal. Right. It's 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 not the ideal because that the self-awareness that's in the self-awareness that's in like okay, man, forgive me. Like even the way that some people may feel like when I speak with them as a priest, I resonate. It, even that is like not ideal, but like I am a product of the society, like God, I I see by myself the God, and I I I I have to go there, which is maybe part of the reason why people may resonate with me as a priest. I go there because I understand it. But like the kind of self-awareness that we're always digging, it's not even really that healthy either. Because, <laughs> because what can what can happen is like, okay, you're not always gonna have a priest who's gonna be like, okay, let's look at this, let's look at this, let's work, work through it. But also say when you're just becoming self-obsessed. Or becoming OCD about this thing to say, you know, psh, knock it off. Like, don't do that. You know what I mean? Don't do that because there's this, everything is about timing. Everything is about the Kairos, not the Kronos. Everything's about that perfect window of opportunity. You sh- like, there's this space where. Father, what does that mean? What you just said, the Kairos versus the Kronos. Yeah, there's, there's, there's Kronos and Kairos. Like Kairos is like timing like a window of opportunity okay christ Christ came at the perfect opportunity he could have came at i mean he could have came in like steampunk like you know what i mean he could have came whenever but he came when he came because in 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 the wisdom of god that was the perfect point to come in in human history sure it wasn't like chronological here's the thing actually everything's chronological now because of when he came not the other way around it wasn't like, you know, Jesus is kind of like the logos, pre-incarnate logos. He's waiting as the time train's going by. He's like, I got to wait for car 9,963, then I'm going to jump. You know what I mean? It's like there was a window in the perfect window of time, which t- is taking account the freedom of man, the freedom of man. And God knows all this. Boom. His, the incarnation happened at that time, whatever. In theory, the icons could all be in like, 1920 suits in theory sure right the, if, the if you understand it transcends, yeah, it transcends it, the, it transcends the it, you should say yeah. but like um what yes i just want to clarify it transcends but like meaning christ could have incarnated in the 1920s sure that, that's my point is like it isn't yeah. just about like oh let's put modern clothing on jesus to make him relevant i mean no like that era, that era of time and the icon, you know, the clothing, that the keton, the mation, all that stuff, like, that is the time, that was the perfect time for him to, that's like, we'll see. It's like, that's the bullseye, right? That's because, the bullseye. because God sees time as a whole, as one, like, like, Dr. Taking Manhattan. account man's freedom, taking account man's freedom, repentance, all those and things, the timeline. Just saw that one part in, like, the time, and I was like, I'm going to go in there. That's when I'll become incarnate. This is the, this is the perfect spot. Okay. Perfect spot. Yeah. So, and it's a mystery. I'm not saying no, but I'm just saying, right? So anyways, getting back to the thing of being like too self-aware. Ugh. So, so it's, it's a thing because if we're, we're talking about addiction and being able to process and like lack of acceptance is what we're getting at. Right. So there's this space where people can become frustrated and they can start seeing themselves and they're like, this is great. I'm seeing myself making progress. But then what happens is if you don't learn to let off the gas in that way, then you start going off the edge of the cliff on the other side. You become neurotic. You know what I mean? And this is very much a problem. So the key thing I'm trying to get at is this inability to accept. It's super simple. And it is a panacea, but it's not a panacea that's easily applied, right? Because I could say, like, 
you could throw whatever situation, right? And it would be correct to say there's a lack of acceptance there. But how that plays out in the healing of the person, that is, you know, with God's help, the only way to kind of like, that that's more difficult. But it, it isn't crazy to say like, yeah, it's a lack of acceptance. That's where the addiction comes from. And that's where the inability to process, that's that's the root of it. And that acceptance. The, sorry, sorry, Father. So just to just to reiterate, I just want to make sure I have it. And hopefully it'll be for the audience as well. It's a lack of what we're talking about. When you say lack of acceptance, you're saying something happens, something happens happens and is it conscious is it unconscious what we somehow no, say i don't accept that that happened somehow internally we both, say i don't accept both. that that happened what how does this how does it's what's, what's going on with it it's both because you'll have people who will my husband cheated on me um with my with my niece and i was pregnant and like I just couldn't believe it. I started drinking, blah, 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 had the baby. Baby was about two years old. I went, I met this wonderful man. And six months ago, all of a sudden, you know, I feel like I had a heart attack and my left side of my face is paralyzed. Like, what's going on? The doctors aren't really sure. They think it's myocarditis, but like, I don't really know what it is, blah, blah, blah. That's very specific. <laughs> okay. so, like... It's not, I'm just, I'm sure someone out there, I mean, forgive me, it's your experience. I'm just, you know, I don't know anything. But like, um, <laughs> so the thing about it is, is like the doctors don't know. I can't like, what's the deal, blah, blah, blah. And like, I'm like, okay, you know, when did this happen? Like, oh, I know it just happened like three months ago. Let's like go back in time, whatever. It's like, oh, well, three months, you know, this is around the time when like, your husband like left you and like you know what I mean it's like but I thought I was past that and I was in therapy for two years blah 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 it's like I moved on I met this wonderful man but like the thing is is like your body the body keeps the score of these things and like oftentimes people will keep and maintain and, and retain these painful experiences and they don't really process them they just kind of shove them down into their body you see what I'm saying? And so it's like, it's on a very deep level. They're not even aware of it. So it's on the level of quote unquote, like the psychologists say the deep side, the, the subconscious, but like it's there, you know what I mean? But it can also be very conscious. You know, people can be like, you know what? I just can't handle, you know what, you know, oh, oh my wife, you know, she's did this. I can't handle, I'm, I'm gonna, and, and for some people, it's like they were always looking for the excuse to go get the hooker and do the blow. You know what I mean? Like there's there. But even that desire to have that. Right. Where did that come from? I mean, they're right. Yeah. Right. Right. You see what I'm saying? Like, right. like Lots of people, you know, sometimes people start doing math because they're like, well, I worked, you know, 14 hours a day, you know, seven days a week. I'm like, well, lots of people do that, but they don't do math. They just drink lots of coffee, you know? Now, here, here's the thing I want to throw in there because it would be incomplete if I don't throw this in there. This isn't about pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you made bad choices and that, that's not what I'm talking about at all. At all. So this is real important because I'm not talking about that at all. Can't emphasize that enough. Because there's things that are at play and this is part of the problem again with the therapy because a good therapist will get you to that place to where you're, you are working on acceptance. But that's what I was trying to say in the story. The lady, she's like, I went to therapy and like, I worked through all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, he left me because like, even if I saw my part of it, okay. Like that's the thing, but see, there's some factors in there that are beyond your control. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There is a demonic component that is beyond yes. your control, uh, right? I think people know that. They know, like, they know it in them somewhere. Because, like, what Father was saying earlier, and I, I'm very sorry, I just got to point it. That Father says that, like, therapy. Father said that the therapy did this thing where sometimes it 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 um actually gets in the way and like deviates away from the natural process of things. 
And in my limited role as a therapist, more as a counselor, I like literally that's one one. Like that's the very first thing I have to work on with a lot of people is like, okay, the feelings that you have about a situation that someone else in the ministry is telling you, you don't need to be feeling that way. I would encourage you to feel that way. If you're feeling anxious about this thing, don't say, I shouldn't feel anxious. Say, why am I feeling anxious? Mm -hmm. Like what's going on there? Like, don't, don't like, you know, if people talk about like their parents and like, they never did anything wrong. I'm like, okay. And like my therapist confirms that I'm like, okay, well, let's take a look at your parents. Like my parents did lots of stuff wrong. That's okay. They're human beings. What are you going to do? But at the same time to simply just say like, I, my parents did nothing wrong suggest there is like an emotion you're avoiding let me stop you right there because that's that's the second thing i was going to bring up there's a demonic component and then there's what's let's call it an adamic component there's people do inherit stuff from their from their families amen call them generational curses call them whatever you want i'm comfortable with that most people aren't but there are things that you will inherit that are not your that are not your fault, but it's your responsibility. Uh, we get a dollar. I'm just kidding. Right. So, like those those things, and here's the thing: the lack of acceptance can simply be that the refusal to accept the demonic component of it, the refusal to accept that, like you know, you've inherited these things because even that feels disempowering for some people now. And you're, it's kind of a weird thing, but like your lack of acceptance of needing to accept that things are out of your control of that in itself can facilitate, you know, neurosis and addiction and all these things. Right. Cause here's the problem. People like, there's a lot of addiction that goes unnoticed, unchecked, and even unqualified as an addiction because it's socially acceptable. Sexual addiction is one of those. With It's the it. one. It's the yeah. one. Right. It's like, I remember, you know, I was, this is the thing that trips people out. Like I was going to 12 step meetings at the age of 14 because shout out to, you know, my godson, uh, Matthew, like, cause I was hanging out with older heads and they were going, you know, we would, I would go with them, go with them to a meeting before a show or before practice, whatever, like before I had even begun my own, you, my own kind of stint with drug use and addiction. You know what I mean? Like, and I just, every single one of those people, when they would share, like, I know that they were hooking up and, and doing whatever. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's part of it, right? Yeah. And there's there's that exchange because, again, at that point in time, this is, you know, this is the early 90s, whatever. It's just like, yeah, you know, um, Huntington Beach, you know, kind of punk rock culture, like 12-step punk rock culture. It's like, God is nowhere in there. You sure. know what I mean? Yeah, and I know God, of, God of like our own understanding, but like let's just between us, like there ain't no God in there. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Like, like here's God, here's the coffee cup. Like that's mm-hmm. so that that reality you see real quickly where these these nature abhors a vacuum, so it's gonna get filled somehow. And like getting back to you know Bob Dylan, you're gonna serve somebody, right? And so. This is why Christ isn't like one of many choices. It's kind of a nicer choice. It's like, if you aren't only, man, only Christ can fulfill these things. Now, that's a real generalized statement. And the way that plays out is very specific, obviously, to each person. But fundamentally, it's like, I've, fundamentally, I have never seen, this is just my own anecdotal experience. What do I know? Right. But I've never seen anybody maintain real sobriety without a real encounter of the divine. Mm. They may not necessarily be orthodox, but the net, the, you know what I mean? You know, I, I got a good friend. I haven't seen him in years. Um, and I, I don't know, I might actually shoot him this episode because I'm going to shout out to him. He'll, he'll know who he is. But like, I look at him still, but like, see, like, I mean, I was with him and and with his family when he was like, he was like that addict, you know what I mean? He just would not get off the heroin. He could not get off the heroin. It was just like, and then what What the reason why he has the years of sobriety he has now is, is he'll tell you, it's like he's encountered God. It's not orthodox, you know what I mean? He's not orthodox, but he's also not just like, here's my higher power, you know what I mean? Sure. 
And so I trust God has got him on this journey, which that's not for me to say, you know what I mean? But I know that God and his love is, is working with everyone. And, and for my boy, you know what I mean? I see his, I see the fact that he's giving glory to God, giving thanks to God in an authentic way as the evidence, it's the fruit. The fruit is he had, because he, how do you explain him being a 12 step before inpatient, outpatient, all the thing doesn't wash having having all the stuff right but when god brings these things in his life a family all these things and then he gets it this is this is not me right and that yeah. real surrender happens right he came to a place of acceptance yeah acceptance is the answer Except, yeah you know what I mean? so um i have a question maybe send us out on father um uh oh and then really quick there is a debate in the in the midst of AA and NA and all that stuff that's been going on 30, 40, 50, whatever years of using the terms higher power versus God. And higher power can be anything you want it to be. I've heard people say some whack stuff in meetings. Uh outright even sometimes proclaiming pagan deities mm -hmm. as their higher power. And I will go on record, I'll die on this hill. The devil will keep you sober. He'll keep you narcotic. Oh, damn. The narcotic and alcohol free as long as you continue to bow down to him. Like he'll do. I know people who've been delivered from very terrible thoughts, very terrible desires by deities from other yeah. and they say, like, well, hey, this is why. And I'm like, yeah, of course. That's sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, the, because the guy who held who was holding you hostage in the first place, you know sure. I mean? he he negotiated his own deal. Yeah, <laughs> he switched. He switched into something. He did something. He's like, well, I'm happy over here too. I'll 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 live in this room. Yeah, that's, that's fine. fine. I'll I live in this house over that. here. Yeah, Just, I'm not kicked completely out. Fine, hey, I'm here. I'll no talk. Problem. I'll talk to management. I'll see what's yeah. going on. I can. No I'll can cut you a deal. That's fine. That's fine. That's no no problem. Deal. If you could sign here, though, please. Um, uh, in, blood, in blood in blood yeah um so father generally speaking what are your thoughts on like and this is this could probably be a topic in and of itself for a whole disc for a whole episode because it's shocker i have a lot of opinions about it too and i'll try and keep them to myself but like what is your uh thoughts on aa and orthodoxy and the sync like the the um syn synchronistic nature like how how can those things those yeah 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 can those three things work together well? I have I have my opinions about it. Um, and I, you know, be expecting at some point in my life to hopefully be able to be able to write a way or concoct a way through God with God's help to be able to make those things work together. Cause I I remember in early AA, I felt like my soul was being ripped in half. Like orthodoxy and AA seemed like they they were had two very different goals. There's two very, at least the AA group I was going to had two very different goals and the language didn't seem compatible. The experiences didn't seem compatible. Nothing seemed very compatible about those two things together. Um, I think they could be, but I, you know, I'd have to take some serious, I like, I could never really work a proper step five, which is essentially a confession um, with someone because I can't give um, the prayer of absolution. I can't do that. Like, I'm just a layman. And like, why would you be working your step five with a person who can't give the prayer of absolution? Like, confess your sins to your priest. Like, so right okay, away. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I, I have always had an understanding that the 12 step program is beneficial. Always. Sure. The problem that I had, in, and I'm definitely, there was a period of time when I was much stronger on this than, than I am now. I don't know if I'm just getting old, but um, the space where it's incompatible is really strong. Mm -hmm. But it's it, qualitatively. But quantitatively, it's a really small gap. It's like a, you know what it is? It's like. God, as you understand him. It's the small rock that causes the dude on the skateboard to fly. Oh, okay, sure. You know I mean? It's the so, goddess you understand him? No. Okay. No, because I've seen people 
work through that, right? Um, and even the and even and, and here's the thing, and I want to clear this about the confession part because even that can work. Because here here's the thing. Um, it's important to understand confession, how how confession works, because confession confession doesn't do just one thing, right? Okay. And so, um, if anyone cares, I would say to you, if you want to have a really good practice, practice confessing your sins nightly to God. I've I've talked about this before, you know, like if there's there's a jordanville prayer book i think it's page 46 i think it's a prayer to the holy spirit it goes through this thing you know it's kind of like you know this kind of litany of issues saying that prayer nightly you know every other night every once in a whole whatever but praying and confessing the sins to god is good and it's blessed you know what i mean um but that confession and this is where the protestants god help them <laughs> you know they're in for a, a horrible uh experience when they pass it like that doesn't cover the whole thing yeah which yeah which that's terrifying so there is this aspect in regards to the kind of like moralistic you know kind of like legal aspect of an infraction that exists and some orthodox people who they get too caught up in the kind of like polemic of like east and west act like that doesn't exist at all in our confession. No, it does actually. Sure. Because, because the reason why you need fundamentally to confess to a priest and you can't just get away with confessing to, you know, your godfather, you know, Boyan is because Boyan doesn't have the authority and can't reconcile you back to the church. That's what I was addressing. Yeah. Right. That's what I was trying to address. So the reconciliation to the church which is the body of Christ, which is a visible reality, which is where the sacraments are experienced. And without the sacraments, primarily of the Eucharist, you don't have the life and the, you don't have the life of Christ. That's just what Jesus says in John six. And it's true. So in the 12 step, you can work these things, but it, it, you know, it's just, you have to understand what its purpose is and there's overlap. Right. Just like with psychology, there's overlap. It's a tool, but it's a tool that's given to a godless. There it is. Churchless like people in society. Yeah. Right. Once you have the church, then the tools then become even more and more relegated to the place of a tool and not the thing himself. Now, that being said, let me say this. If I could. This isn't the ideal, but it's an ideal remedy for a situation that isn't ideal. If I could, um, which I don't know, maybe we'll talk about this, Andrew, but like, you know, I see now that a lot of people need to go through 12 steps before they can even like, like going through being going through the 12 steps, I, I, I I'm tempted to make it part of part of catechism. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because there's a lot of people who I recognize now, like, and I've known this for for a while. Like, I, the first person I saw this was like, not in theory, but like experience was with like Moses, you know, me, me, memory eternal. Like, you can't just take someone like. What happens is, and this is this is where we struggle. Like orthodoxy is so foreign to us, not just because we weren't raised in it, like a Romanian or Serbian, it's just kind of culture. Cause like, you know, a lot of Romanians and Serbians, they don't get it either. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, but there's a reality in regards of just how our culture forms us as human beings on a psychological level, right? Sure. So long story short. People think, people like, they want to hit the philokalia, they want to do all the stuff when they really need to hit the big book. Sure. Right? Because their emotional development is is retarded. Yeah. A lot of people, they're most, they're emotionally retarded. And, and I don't mean retarded like California, like 
like like clinically like you're retarded like rest of yeah, development you're stunted you're, you're stunted. stunted so to get people to develop emotionally is necessary in order for them to even begin to apprehend the spiritual life so what a lot of people confuse with the spiritual life you know can't really begin and the reason why I do air quotes is because it's all spiritual, like we were saying earlier, right? right? So it's not like I'm trying to have this dichotomy of like, here's your emotional life, here's your spiritual life, you deal with this first. You, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. But what I am saying is, yes, like there's a component to that, that the 12 steps by God's grace really help a person do that work so that they can begin to live the spiritual life. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense at all what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And I think very much so. I think like I'm a big fan of the 12 steps. I think the 12 steps what what concerns me is the few orthodox people I know who have worked the 12 steps and this is not everyone but someone sometimes it can become there's there is a a, a water and oil um interaction thing here that's happening where it seems to be where someone ends up extremely one or the other like they don't seem to be able to mix and in theory yeah but the devil's in the details once you start getting down to it like your step 12 of a very which is to continuing like you're with the presence of god step 12 being you have the presence of god with you now take it to other people and help Oh, that sounds very, very orthodox, you know, like, yeah, absolutely. But on, on a, on a day to day level, I, I don't really see a lot of that from the orthodox community who have worked the 12 steps, just my limited interaction. I'm talking on, on two hands, I could count the amount of people that I know who have worked the 12 steps who are orthodox. Um, and there seems to be this whole like continuing need to justify from the people I've talked to they're working the 12 steps they're having the 12 steps and not only that but it can also become a substitute for uh for mm -hmm. orthodoxy you know that 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 being 12 steps they go to church they take part in the sacraments blah 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 but their main emphasis continues to come back to the 12 steps and on theory again all this sounds fine this is yeah, fine but, but i will say this though the, a part of that though is because they may rightly or maybe wrongly realize that they really don't apprehend the quote unquote spiritual life as it's explicitly understood. You know what I mean? That's so, and so, does that make sense? So I, I think you eloquently stated what I was trying to say. And I think I don't know what the reason for that is. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It, it seems like to use the word that we're throwing, it seems to retard people a little bit with the 12 steps it seems to be holding it becomes at a certain point like a millstone like they're kind of dragging these notions still around and at a certain point like well yeah it's kind of like the it's it's what it is it's it's something that was used as an anchor to keep someone from being drifted out to sea mm -hmm. but then but then when the tide began to change it ends up drowning them mm -hmm. because okay, okay. You, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. here's the problem with any of these things, the 12 steps, identity, you know what I mean? People who hold on to their identity. I'm Serbian first, then I'm Orthodox. I'm okay. Black first, then I'm this. Like, you know, um, I, I, my identity is my sexual preference, whatever. Like, all of these things, anything that's idolatrous will always be a problem. Hmm. Hmm. So the problem is the idolatry. The problem is that they the problem is that they've elevated it to a place that a that a tool should not be elevated. Like, like, so it's like, not the tool, it's the person who it's, okay. Yeah, because yeah. here here here's what it looks like. Because by nature these things are not opposed to each other. Okay. They're not opposed right. to each other. People okay. make it so it's like, oh, this thing's helping me. Great. And then as soon as someone starts saying the program, the 12 step, the program, it's like Okay, that's good, but then it gets to be the thing where it's just like the program, the twelve steps. Like, okay, it's kind of like, you know, it's like I'm eating a steak salad. It's delicious. You know what I mean? Juicy steak, lettuce, onion, olives, 
right? And, uh, you know, you have them with my family, all of a sudden start talking about beyond polite dinner conversation, you know, that Ginsu knife, that Ginsu knife, that Ginsu knife. It's like, man, shut up. Like, eat the salad. We're enjoying the salad. Like, the Ginsu knife that cut the steak. It's like, eat the salad. Enjoy the steak. Like, when you start saying the program, the program, the program, it's like, the program is great. Like, that's good that whatever, but it's just like, you're starting, it's starting to become an idol. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, is, it isn't about the thing. And then someone goes like, well, people do that about Orthodox in the church. It's like, well, yes and no, right? Yes and no. Because the difference is, we start talking about God, that's like love and that's a relationship and that's the thing. You know what I mean? And that's for everyone. That's for everyone. The 12 yeah. steps are not for everyone. It's a it's a piece that you've turned into the whole. It's like a piece you that you've turned into the whole. But the church is the whole. The church, the is, church the whole. is the whole. The church is the whole. God is the yeah. whole. And that's the thing that people, you know, again, kind of a weird kind of like paradox thing. But it's part of the reason why people need the 12 steps, I think, worked properly. Because if you work the 12 steps properly, that you'll actually kind of see that that's a problem. And you'll, 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 you'll well, build it you'll build out the faculty to kind of like be self-aware about these things, but it's, it's tough. you know. I mean, it's, it's sanity. It's sanity. And like, and God can restore you to sanity according to the second step. So I won't harp on this too much longer. I don't know. Like, I agree. I think that I've worked at 12 steps. I think that like um, the first time I was in a meeting ever, I remember thinking specifically, no disrespect, but this program just reeks of God. It just like reeks like the whole everything was just like, you know, and I've had my best luck with quitting to, like um, uh, problematic behaviors by admitting my powerlessness over them, admitting like this thing has got me licked. Now I can start fighting now. Like it's not every time. Oh, I'm powerless. I can't help it. Well, oh, I can't do this anymore. I can't fight. So I'll just do it. It's more like, no, you're powerless. Now God can help. Like, because you've admitted, I can't do this. I can't do this. I need God's help. So admitting powerless is a surefire way to be able to. And I mean, to Father's point, um, I wanted the thing I never really try to emphasize when I work with people about the end result of what their recovery can be is I never promise happiness. Like happy, joyous and free is not something I ever really try to advertise to people. What, what I can tell them is like you can live in proper accordance with your reality. You can see Father Sarah from Rose says sobriety is seeing things as they are. And um well, there's the acceptance. There is right. The, exactly. if, if the seed of the addiction is that you are not accept that it's a lack of acceptance, Father Sarah from Rose says that's it. Sobriety mm -hmm. is acceptance. Like seeing it, seeing things for what they are. And so, and I tell people all the time that like God love them. I see them all the time. Normies, what we call non-addicts, but like normies, there are parts of their soul um, that they just can't g explore. They can't go there. It's dangerous. And I have those parts of my soul too, without a doubt. There's things I can't think about for very long. Otherwise, I'll end up in a dark place, blah, blah, blah. And not a good dark place, like a self-absorbed dark place. Um, but like uh, at the same time, if you can get to the point where you can start to really like push some of your ego aside, you get this like really down to earth, like warm humility of being able to just admit like, Oh, I don't get that. I don't understand what that is. I have no idea what that is. Like, I, I don't know what you're talking about right now. I'm lost. I'm, 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 I'm always kind of confused a little bit. And like that kind of honesty, like, I think it's oftentimes really refreshing and I'll end with like, um, father Cosmos talked about this, uh, bishop he was with who they were both from what i understand i've never seen pictures of either one of them but overweight father cosmos was talking to this bishop who was overweight and he was like uh you know have you ever thought about dieting he's like yeah i've done the dieting i've done the exercise i find it really hard you know to lose the weight and then father cosmos was like oh you know there's sometimes these, these gland issues sometimes like there's these hormones and the bishop was like no 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 i just like to eat too much that's the problem and it's just like and father cosmos was like a breath of fresh air just like that honesty, just that be able to just be like, oh, that's so wonderful. And like, I've seen it, 
teachers, speaking of teachers from the beginning, respond so well to, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. What are you talking about? Please explain it to me. Please explain it to me because I don't get it. And I, and I see people be like, do you understand what I'm saying? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, no, it's okay if you don't. You know, just tell me you don't. It's okay. Like, I don't know who you're trying to impress. You're not impressing me. But like, you know, um, just and so when you're an alcoholic and you're in recovery, you get to the point where you, that honesty becomes accessible to you to a degree. And then you start to see like the people who maybe don't have it as much. And and then you start to be like, oh, OK, you know, I understand. I understand this is a sickness. There's something here you can't explore right now. That's OK. I understand. It's really hard. But the 12 steps were really, really fundamental in me being able to do that and me being able to see that part of myself and not flinch away from it. like, yeah, I failed as a father. Yeah, I failed as a son. I did all that stuff like that stuff is part of my story. It is who I am. So I've been talking a lot. So I'm tired. So I'm sorry, guys. Um, I've been talking a lot this episode. So I want to back down. Uh, I had a question lined up for the end of the episode. It wasn't as so much a question um john sent in a really wonderful email a couple months ago about kissing what what the significance of kissing is i want to read that next time but it's a little bit late tonight but i think i'll read that next time it's really well done and it's very long it's very well written so i want to do it the start with that that next time yeah or yeah something like that something like that so um okay i think that's it um so we have our merch store royalpath.store yep okay got it in one um that none of our proceeds go to us they go to uh saint mary's the church and then uh one third of it goes to the person who actually makes the merch um there is, is a anytime we talk about music we put it on a playlist on spotify called royal path podcast music or something like that link is in the description blah 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 mm-hmm. um if you want to write out and ask Father a question or ask us a question in general or you need Father's contact info, please reach out at andrew at royalpath.network. Um, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I just went through a whole list of people who are at wanting Father's contact info, and I think I got through all of them. If I did not, please reach back out to me. This is a one-man operation over here. I am one man answering all the emails, and I am... You know, it's, it's, you know, we should get an intern. That's all I'm saying. Like that intern will have the cushiest job, but we should get an intern. Um, And then uh, I think that's it. I don't, I can't think of anything else. Um, So, okay. Thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.